Good morning. Welcome to worship. We're so glad that you could join us today as we connect to uh, the Word of God and through the Word of God, connect to the God that calls us uh, to worship, and even connect to one another, even as we might not be with one another yet, although that's, uh, that's changing soon, more on that later, uh, but as we connect to one another uh, through the Holy Spirit that binds us together, we gather together in worship this morning. Today we're going to be talking about a resilient passion, uh, that enthusiasm that comes from our relationship with the Lord and from following the Lord. May we pray together as we begin. Dear God, we thank you for today. We thank you that you have called us and shaped us as your people. Help us to worship today in spirit and in truth. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Psalm 19, 1 through 6. For the pure and shining one, a poem of praise by King David, his loving servant. 
God's splendor is a tale that is told. His testament is written in the stars. Space itself speaks his story every day through the marvels of the heavens. His truth is on tour in the starry vault of the sky, showing his skill in creation's craftsmanship. Each day gushes out its message to the next, night with night whispering its knowledge to all. Without a sound, without a word, without a voice being heard, yet all the world can see its story. Everywhere its gospel is clearly read so all may know. What a heavenly home God has set for the sun, shining in the superdome of the sky. See how he leaves his celestial chamber each morning, radiant as a bridegroom ready for his wedding, like a day-breaking champion eager to run his course. He rises on the horizon, completing his circuit on the other, warming lives and lands with his heat. As we come to our time of prayers of the people, we want to especially remember those who have lost loved ones as we are in a fortunate time where COVID cases are going down. Um, we see a, a rise uh, in deaths and um, we want to remember that those are people and whether it be from COVID or from whatever uh, instance, their people are grieving because of loss of loved ones. And uh, we want to be mindful and prayerful uh, of them this morning. And there might be other things on your heart. Please take a second, uh, a minute to, uh, to pray, and then I will lead us in uh, today's prayer of the people. Holy One, creator of the stars and the seas, your steadfast love is shown to every living thing. Your word calls forth countless worlds and souls. Your law revives and refreshes. Forgive our misuse of your gifts, that we may be transformed by your wisdom to manifest for others the mercy of our crucified and risen Lord. Amen.
Welcome to Getting to Know UBC Kids. Today we have another UBC kid. Hey, UBC kid, who are you? I'm Calvin Dunn. Did you say Dunn? Mm -hmm. That's my last name. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do you have a middle name? Clark. Clark? Calvin Clark Dunn. Awesome. Hey, Calvin Clark Dunn, where are you? I'm in my room. Okay. You're in your room. Who's that picture of behind you? It's a picture of Henry Imba. Okay, great. That's awesome. Well, cool. Um, do you have something to show us? Um, yes. This is my favorite stuffed animal, Munchmax. Munchmax. Does he talk? Um, no, my, but my brother does a very good impersonation of him. Okay, that's cool. That's great. I think I've heard that. All this is sounding very familiar, but that's cool. Are you ready for a big question? Uh-huh. Okay, here's my big question. Is in our Bible story today that we're looking at in the sermon, Jesus gets excited. Um, have you ever thought of Jesus getting excited and what might excite Jesus? Um... Well, yeah, I've kind of thought of Jesus getting excited. Yeah, okay. and I think he might get excited when somebody got baptized or something. Okay, that's great. Yeah, I can see that. That's awesome. Um. Well, a fun fact about me is that I can snap with both hands. Well, let's see it. Prove it. That is very, very good. I like it. I like it. Um, do you know that I can't snap? Did you know that about me? Yes. Yes, I do. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, Calvin Clark Dunn, thank you so much for your time. And uh, thank you for being our cool UBC kid this week. Have a good night. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.
I was made aware of and started watching this week a documentary on PBS on Black Church in America that traces the history of African Americans and uh, the development of the uh, church and of the Christian movement, uh, specifically uh, the black church movement, uh, from the time of slavery up until, up until today. One of the things that I was struck by, not that I didn't know it, but just struck to hear it again, was that one of the, one of the things that white slaveholders tried to do to justify uh, the evils of the institution of slavery was they tried to influence uh, preachers and missionaries to paint this picture of Jesus as meek and um, overly pious and calm and still that just did what was ever asked of him and never uh, never went against uh, the establishment. They tried to paint that picture of Jesus in order to um, subvert the uh, subvert a message uh, to to slaves that it was the Christ-like thing to do uh, to be involved in the institution of slavery. Uh, of course, hopefully, of course, uh, hopefully it's obvious that's an unbiblical picture of Jesus. It's a it, it ignores not just one but many texts and narrative descriptions of who Jesus was as he was here on earth. This is the same Jesus who said, I give peace to you, and at the same time said, do not, earlier said, do not think I came to bring peace. What he meant by that is that it is a peace that comes from God, a peace that is a divine peace. It isn't our human, worldly, crafted idea of peace, which usually resembles more of, I get what I want, and you just deal with it. That's not the peace that Jesus came to give. So there's passage upon passage and picture upon picture uh, of Christ being opposite in many ways of this docile sort of doormat uh, kind of figure that they were trying to paint, uh, that some were trying to paint at the time. And the documentary uh, talks about that. If you were going to try to refute that idea, and there's been other times and or reasons for justification that people have tried to paint Jesus in that light as this overly uh, overly docile kind of pushover uh, sort of figure. If you were going to go to a biblical text to refute that, one of the first ones that you would go to is what we're going to look at today. In John chapter 2 and in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, it's later on uh, in their Gospels, but we're, look, we're going to look at John chapter 2, uh, beginning in verse 13 today. And we're going to talk about, in our theme of resilience, a resilient passion. Now, I'll spoil it for you. This is the narrative where Jesus clears the temple. And as I said, it's in John chapter 2 early on. In Matthew, Mark, and Luke, it's, it occurs during, uh, the narrative occurs during the Passion Week. And so the question comes, did Jesus do it twice? Or... Did John choose to um, go with a theme and include this narrative early on in his gospel where Matthew, Mark, and Luke put it chronologically when it actually occurred? I, I go back and forth on this, and, and scholars in some ways do, but the, the predominant scholarly opinion is, and, is that there was actually two occurrences where Jesus did this, and John records the earlier one, and Matthew, Mark, and Luke records the later one. I... I would tend to line up uh, with that view. At any rate, it is a picture of Jesus that, and that sometimes is disruptive to what we think of when we think of Jesus here on earth. And so others have, have gone to great lengths to show exactly or to explain exactly what is happening, what character trait of Christ we are seeing in this clearing of the temple. Some will say that he's just angry and he's, lashing out in that anger and someone to try to calm that and say well this is this is a righteous anger and so you might even hear the term i've heard the term before righteous indignation is what jesus is displaying some will say and that as we're going to to say today um that this is passion this is the passion of jesus 
And, and as I said, we're titled, entitling this sermon today, Resilient Passion. But I was a little hesitant to even use that because in our day and age, I think passion becomes an overused word and sometimes is kind of used to describe sort of a self-aggrandizing or a, a selfish um, act of just doing whatever you want to do. And that's not what Jesus is doing here. But the clo- most closely relatable word is passion. Some will point to exactly what the disciples say when they quote Psalm 69, that this is Jesus as a zealot. Uh, this is the zeal of Jesus. And certainly Jesus is displaying zeal, but because of um, the other connotations of zealot, um, or rel- almost to the line of religious fanatic, I, I don't think that would be a, a, the best descriptor of the entire narrative. And so passion is probably... Uh, probably the best description. So here we see Jesus with a passion that is directly tied to his allegiance to the divine purpose, to what he was called to, to what he knows of the character of God and the will of God. And that is being disruptive. That that is being disrupted. And so Jesus cannot stand for it because his purpose is to follow and to honor God He cannot stand for the purposes and plans of God to be disrupted. And that's what's happening at the temple uh, in this occurrence and in the later occurrence uh, in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Let's just read it and we can talk about uh, the resilient passion that we see displayed here. When it was almost time for the Jewish Passover, Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple courts, he found people selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and others sitting at tables exchanging money. So this is what's happening. This is the outer court of the temple, probably most likely the Gentile courts. And it's Passover. So we have people coming from all over and coming into uh, the temple. And it was lawful for them, and, and the law required uh, the presentation of offerings that included sheep and cattle. It, it required an offering uh, that, would, that would require doves as well. And so... Some people in the temple courts were taking advantage of the situation, and instead of having people travel with their sheep and cattle, they were selling them, uh, selling sheep and cattle to them when they got there. And there's some reports or thoughts that they were even, even though the law would have required the best, they weren't even selling them the best of the sheep and cattle. And there's a, a high possibility that they were largely inflating the price and the cost, and so it goes completely contrary to what God was asking for in their worship uh, at the temple. Now, the the deal with the money changers. There was a certain coin, a currency required in in paying the temple tax. And, of course, people are coming from all over. They have currency from where they come from. And so the money changers were exchanging their currency for the temple tax currency. And, again, there is thought that they might have been doing so at an inflated price. And, and as an attempt to capitalize on, on the situation. Again, subverting and manipulating and distorting uh, the purpose of coming to the temple and the worship that was to occur in the temple and specifically at Passover. Verse 15, so he made a whip out of cords and drove all from the temple cords, both sheep and cattle. So he did that with the whip. Then he scattered the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. To those who sold the doves, he said, get these out of here. Stop turning my father's house into a market. His disciples remembered that is written, zeal for your house will consume me. And that's in Psalm 69. The Jews then responded to him, what sign can you show us to prove your authority to do all of this? What what right does Jesus have to come into the temple and to dictate what should and should not be done and how it should or should not be done? Jesus answered them, destroy this temple and I will raise it again in three days. They replied, it has taken 46 years to build this temple and you're going to raise it in three days? But the temple he had spoken about was his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples recalled what he had said. Then they believed the scripture and the words that Jesus had spoken. 
So in this resilient passion, what do we see of Jesus? Well, first we see a passionate and enthusiasm for obedience. Not a rigid, not a rigid law abiding, but a heart for obedience, for doing things as God intended them to be done. This was worship. This was the Passover. This was the the time where God had provided for the people of Israel, had delivered them up out of Egypt. And Jesus, I think at this point, knew this was also a sign that pointed to the great deliverance that comes through him as the Messiah. And what was going on was wrong because it was taking away from the worship. It was taking away not just from what should happen at the temple, but it was taking away from people. It was... It was, again, a manipulation of what God had asked for. It was close to obedience because they were presenting the right things for the offering, but it was far from obedience because they were doing so for the purpose of their own selfish gain and for the purpose of capitalizing on a situation. The other passion we see in Jesus is a passion for the outsiders. People who've come from outside of Jerusalem, yes, but also people who were outside of Judaism for the Gentiles. Also people who uh, would have been considered marginalized because they were poor. Jesus stood up for the outsider. I had a great conversation this week about what shaped Jesus' response. Obviously, his divine origin and the fact that he was the Messiah and he was doing the will of the Father shaped who he was. But as Jesus came in human form, He was born to a poor family. He might have sat there in the carpenter shop. The carpenter shop might have been where he learned to make the the whip in the first place. But he saw people who were on the margins of society. His own parents, earthly parents, were on the margins of society. He would hear his mom, who treasured all those things in her heart, he would hear Mary tell her about the people that showed up at his birth. That, oh, that, oh, by the way, was well off the beaten path and well in, a, in, in an unexpected place, certainly for the Messiah to be born. Jesus knew what it was to be marginalized, knew what it was to be an outsider, and knew that the divine plan and purpose was for the outsider to be brought in, for the love and compassion of God to extend beyond this worldly religious elitism to the poor and the hungry and those on the outside. They're the very ones that he was sent for. And overall, we see a passionate purpose. The word there for zeal, zeal for your house will consume me, that word zeal, the Greek word there actually means ardor, ardor, which means enthusiasm which means, in this, in this sense, passion. And now, we get a certain picture when we think of enthusiasm. We get a certain mental image when we think of passion. But what we see in Jesus is a clear and understood direction for the purpose of his coming, for the purpose of his life, to know and to display the character of God. And that compelled him, that gave him no other choice but to stand up and to make a scene. Not just for the sake of making a scene. Not even really to draw attention to himself. But to draw attention to what is right. This is an unfamiliar picture of Jesus that we see here. And we struggle with, well, I thought we're supposed to be peaceful and loving, and what about this picture? What we need to understand is that Jesus was pursuing the peace that God promises and the love that God possesses. Jesus was pursuing that and demonstrating that. And that was his goal. Often, our purpose for raising a ruckus or for causing a scene Often it comes down to self-serving things and to self-serving ideas. And our passion 
uh, is misguided because it doesn't include the overall purposes of God. But when it does, when our passion includes the purpose of God, it falls right in line with what Christ is doing here. This passion, this zeal, this fire for the purpose of God is what we're called to emulate and to demonstrate in our lives as well. The need for it to be resilient, the need for a resilient passion become, comes because sometimes, many times, we lose heart. We lose sight of what the actual purpose of God is or we lose the desire and the enthusiasm for looking beyond ourselves and looking towards what is right and pursuing that. We lose it. That flame is, for whatever reason, quenched. And you know the enemy of that. The enemy of this passion is apathy. We'll come and we'll We'll do our religious observances. We'll, we'll read our religious text. But we're just tired of fighting. But let's be careful. What Jesus is, not, is doing here is not fighting. He's not fighting. He's not making enemies of those people he's seen and driving them out with a whip. He is pursuing the purpose of God to show and demonstrate the character of God. He is pursuing that. And in that pursuit, he has to stand up in this, in this particular instance. Let us not fight. Let us pursue. Let us pursue Christ. The goal of our faith. The object of our faith. And when we find our flame is flickering, when we find our passion for the things of Christ is dwindling, let us look. Jesus looked and observed and saw what was wrong because he looked beyond our, himself. Let us listen. Let us listen to others. Let us listen to the voice of the Holy Spirit within us that we hear through Scripture, that we hear in prayer. And that, yes, we hear often in others. And let us pray fervently. Let us pray fervently that we might pursue the purposes of God. That that fire that we sometimes think has to look and sound a certain way or has to be obtrusive or has to be unkind, that the fire would be what God has put there. And that we would pursue those things. Do not grow weary in doing good. For at the proper time. For at the proper time. God will exalt. God will lift up. God will bring up. Jesus didn't fight for fight's sake. This sort of passion led him to a cross where he would be ridiculed and rejected. Yet his purpose carried him beyond the grave. Carried him beyond the grave to ultimate victory. That is the pursuit. I'll say it once more. Let us not grow weary in doing good. May our passion be resilient. Let's pray. Dear God, there are many who have believed and trusted in you for many years. They have seen and observed things that they know to be wrong. And they and me and us and we often just resolve ourselves so that's the way things are. God, instead, let us resolve ourselves to continue to pursue you. To continue to pursue you in all things. And there might be a time where we need to step aside and, and understand that. But God, let us be led by you and guided by you. And I pray for an enthusiasm and for an energy 
that reflects Christ. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. announcements this morning. Hope you received word that we will regather for in-person worship beginning the 21st of March. So not next Sunday, but the next Sunday. Uh, that will be both services. We will require masks and distancing, and those services will still be live streamed uh, as well uh, for the time being. We're going to continue to have uh, prayer and Bible study online uh, during this time, but uh, for the next month or so, uh, we'll evaluate uh, what other things uh, might be able to, to regather. Our youth will regather uh, beginning on Wednesday nights uh, that week of the 21st. Also, if you know anybody that might be out for spring break on that uh, week before, uh, the week of the uh, 14th, uh, we will have a time of uh, kids fun day on Tuesday. And then on Friday night, we'll have a movie night uh, that everyone is invited to. So we'll have more details about those things coming up. But those are just some uh, dates to be aware of. Uh, one final date, uh, June the 27th. Uh, that will be our 100th anniversary. Uh, we'll have a service in some form or fashion. Uh, still working out details of that, but lots of volunteers are working hard uh, on that, uh, get, getting information and uh, up, uh, redrafting our history uh, to update to update that history. Uh, also, um, we have volunteers that are cleaning up our library space uh, to be able to display. Um, ongoing uh, some of our church history and also to provide a place uh, for people to um, have small uh, small time uh, together. And so uh, we will be cleaning out those books in the library. If you would like any of those, um, the church office is open from 8 to noon Monday through Friday. And so we're going to give you till the 19th of March, uh, till March 19th, uh, to come and get what you would like to get or, or look at what you might like to look at. Uh, so thank you for uh, understanding and for being a part of that. Thank you once again for being here today. As we go and as we go out, the word weariness still sticks with me. We talked about this three weeks ago or so. But I know you're weary. And I know we get that way. But may the hope and promise of Christ May the mercy and forgiveness that is available, may it ignite in us a passion and enthusiasm to be as Christ has made us for the purpose of his kingdom. Grace and peace to you. Thank you so much.